on the air today? Yes, we are, because that is the name of our show. Welcome. I am Sam DeLove, and this is our Children of Airte after show <laughs> slash Turtle and Baby Frog Enthusiast Club. With me today are Jen, player of our friendly neighborhood troublemaker, Morgan <laughs> Flynn, Alicia, who plays Peruza Armstrong, attorney at law, and Hope, who is our granny for hire and children's <laughs> author, Miss Robin Beckett. And I'm not going to waste any time. Let's let them introduce themselves just a little further. Jen? Uh, yeah, that that covers it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jen Kretschmer. You can find me on the interwebs as at DreamWisp. Uh, and yeah, during during normal weeks, I am playing your friendly neighborhood troublemaker, Maeve Morgan Flynn. But uh, <laughs> tonight, we're here to answer questions and talk about the things. Also, please go vote if you have not yet. Yay. And your polling place is still open. You can watch this on YouTube later. <laughs> but if not, please hang out and stay. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Alicia Marie on the socials. I'm Alicia Marie Body. And yes, I do usually play for his Armstrong attorney, barbarian at law, but um, in real life, I guess I am a costumer and actor. So I'm a little tired of my voice. Whenever I'm tired, my voice reflects how tired I am. <laughs> That's why I sound a little off, but I'm here. I'm happy to answer questions. I like hanging <laughs> out with these fine people, you know. <laughs> And hi, everybody. I'm Hope Lavelle. You can follow me on the socials at the Hope Lavelle. And yes, while I do normally pay Robin, I'm also a dungeon master on Misfits of Alceta every Wednesday on the That's How We Roll channel. Come check it out. It's really fun. Uh, and I love being a dungeon master. It's it's my first time and I'm learning lots. Good. You're so good. You're so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and while you're checking that out, please do also check out our sponsors. Idle Champions of the Forgotten Realms. We're giving away two codes, and you can type exclamation point code in chat for a free Electrum Chest in game. There's Die Hard Dice, purveyors of clicky clacky math rocks in pretty, pretty colors. Use code AIRTE at checkout for a 10% discount. We'll also be doing a $20 promotional giveaway in chat during the stream. And Sirenscape, because epic games require epic music. <laughs> and with that, on with our show, but with one note, if you want to share your questions with us. Just ask your question with question in all caps in chat. In fact, our very own Obo Lauren to demonstrate we got all the answers last week, right? We talked for like five minutes with Julian and that's pretty much all we'll ever need to know. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just just all all of all of it. We just got five minutes and all of the questions yeah. for seventy three episodes of lore. Right? Yeah, just just five minutes. As Julian is groggy from however many years of sleeping. <laughs> I think also we were just sort of in shock that we actually found him. <laughs> found the <a> person. <laughs> it was like, oh wow, there he is. Did you really? Did you have any expectations ahead of time of where you thought he might have been? Like, certainly we didn't expect on the floor surrounded by some glowy wingdings font yes. in the middle of the air realm. <laughs> not a clue. Not, no clue. not a single clue. Uh, just, yeah. you know, it was, yeah. I, I, I honestly wasn't sure we would ever find him. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I thought if we were going to find him that we'd find him like really early on in the series. I thought, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll see him in the rat cave or something like that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, the fact I, that you're reading him late, it was just, it was surprising. <laughs> I'll, I, I don't know if I've revealed this before, but I, I will reveal exclusively uh, oh. here that early on in the campaign, I thought Silas's name was an anagram of Julian's and we were missing a middle name and that Silas was actually Julian. And Ooh, so I was name. I was early on very oh. suspicious of Silas in part because <laughs> I thought his name was anagramming for Julian. <gasps> We would have torn Silas a new one for that. <laughs> but that would have been that would have been interesting. So I, I had no clue where we were gonna meet Julian. I thought we might have had him with us for a while. <laughs> I think um I wouldn't have expected to ever find I didn't expect to ever 
I think I'd forgotten that that was even an option was to find Julian, but yeah. um, I didn't think I'd find him in the bottom of like a sticky place with air and the florists and like here of all places, you know? It was, it, we understand now why he was there at the time, but certainly not anything I in particular saw coming. That said, Maverick 2 notes that Jen, or maybe Maeve, or maybe Jen oh. and Maeve, looked a little suspicious. <laughs> Maeve without Jen. <laughs> <Love> <laughs> so if you looked a little suspicious during Julian's story, is there anything you'd like to share with the class? I mean, I think Maeve, by nature of being a trickster, expects everyone else to be a trickster. Um, <laughs> and part of the reason that she is guarded with people is because she expects, it's a little bit of she expects to be treated the way that she treats people. Um, and part of what she has grown to do is become more trusting. But with this person who we know is closely aligned with people who have, you know, double-crossed us, uh, there was reason to be a little suspicious. So Maeve was searching for because there were there were inconsistencies in Ivy's story, it felt like there might be reasons to have inconsistencies in Julian's story. So trying to parse out those bits and pieces, that's I think that's why Maeve was uh, suspicious. But she also picked up on Julian being more direct than she had expected. And once that started happening, I think she backed off of the suspicion a little bit. Because anyone who answers the question, the question of why should we trust you with, you shouldn't? It's a, you know, that's an interesting place to start from. Not usually the trickster's response, I'll grant. Mm. Or maybe it's a higher level trick. I mean, that's a very high level trickster response, which I, I love if that was, if, if, if that's the case and we're getting like Maeve is up against a trickster of that caliber, that will be delightful. But it also, would I be mean, at that point, yeah, you respect the, the, the yeah. player. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be really fun to level up the trickster game through meeting someone who's better at it than she is. Mm. Um, but yeah. But preliminary, you think the vibes are good? Cautiously optimistic, I guess. Particularly for a group that has overall had fairly healthy suspicions, although, Jen, just to follow up a little bit, mm -hmm. this very distressing first to catch on to like, hey, what if I be maybe not so much on the up and up? And yet, we've you wouldn't have even been able to get at Julian to distrust him were it not with some help from some Pulsar, which has seemed to be a relationship Maeve is more open to than any other being off the bat that we've seen. Yeah, um, that I think... I think what's happening there is it's tapping into something that predates some of Maeve's walls. Um, and I think there is an inherent understanding that she has of whatever this entity is, that that, that connection um, is a different level i think there's reason for suspicion but there's there's a sense of it, it's just one of those instinctual things for her i think yeah i don't know i don't know how to explain it well but i think that's just that's the vibes that i think Maeve is getting from this being so it's just a very high threshold for vibes then <laughs> I guess so, yeah. I mean, th there's been no reason to distrust this being. Um, there's a, a I, I almost want to say love coming from this being that we haven't encountered with any other creature we've met. Um, mm. 
yeah, it, it's it's it almost feels more like a part of herself than it does something external. Hmm. I mean, you say any other creature we've met, but I think we have met one of the most loving niece ever possible to meet. <laughs> Terza, I have like I have not had you on this show, Lisa, since we knew whence the moose. <laughs> Were you sitting on that the whole time, by the way? <laughs> Did you know the moose the whole time? Were you holding back on us? Legally, you were obligated to answer on this show. Yeah, I am. Okay, I'm legally obligated to answer. I will legally, say, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> the fun thing, like, I think we talked about this, like, in previous episodes. Like, we all, when we developed our characters, we all had a meeting with Deb to tell her, like, you know, what we, what the core of our characters were. And then we all had, like, subsequent meeting to say, like, where we saw our character going in this. And then Deb asked our permission to then take our story and do with it what she wanted. So we had to trust in Deb in certain ways, but there were certain things that I knew that she was going to allow me to let come out. The hardest part was waiting for the like when is that moment gonna happen so when it does we're like yes you know, i got to actually say what it actually is you know what i mean so yeah yay it made me very happy <laughs> so to recap mm -hmm. silas secretly a julian Verusa. <laughs> holding back on moose stuff hope is there something we need to know it's like now's the time if if, if any more of uh revelations are yeah. going to come down it's robin like, it's like, an open nugget. book and it's a very big book so <laughs> maybe you just haven't read it all yet <laughs> or looked at all the pictures in its album <laughs> yeah a little tiny but, nugget <laughs> <yo>. <laughs> Actually, getting to Julian was a bit of an affair. I think that was maybe the most extended single trap sequence that we have had in uh, Children of Verte thus far. I know uh, Maverick 2 is wondering uh, which challenge or trap we thought was set uh, for you, any of you, to have the best chance of solving it. Oh. I'm going to guess it was wasn't the awesome globe of death that uh, Robin adored so much and worked out very well for her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, can we talk about, though, how we had the option of skipping the entire event because we were already at the Julian room at one point, but then we were like, no, this seems like a trap. Let's go the <laughs> other way, which then became the trap. And then we fell through the freaking floor and then we were there anyways. And I'm like, we could have skipped all of this. And yeah. we just, you know, been a little more trusting, I suppose. <laughs> well, but then you were trusting and look how well that went for you. You made a new friend made out of wind. <laughs> I know. Oh, but seriously, do y'all think uh, Deb tees up individual challenges or traps that are geared for your character? Like, we really saw Feruza hold it down with those <laughs> doors at the beginning of the sequence. And bamf from Robin made so much, so much easier. And, yo, just popping into an ethereal little place. Turns out, mm -hmm. fantastic defense against spikes. Uh, do you think she sets up individual challenges targeted at your characters, or do you think it's more open-ended? What do you guys think? I think it's open-ended. I think she makes puzzles and, and things like that to where only through the power of friendship and all of us working <laughs> together oh, can they be made like can they be opened i don't think she's ever made one that's specifically for one person i think she yeah. really likes teamwork and us having to help each other to get things done mm -hmm. yeah i would agree with that i think i think deb loves to set up puzzles that take a couple of different types of characters to solve them and mm -hmm. a couple of different types of cooperation to get mm -hmm. through them um yeah. And she knows where our strengths individually as players and as characters are. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certainly pathways to solutions um, using those, but also with things like the, 
the ice skating puzzle. Um, there were multiple <sighs> pathways to solve that. And yeah. we took a route that she wasn't anticipating. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, as a DM, she does the best thing, which is when the players come to you with something that's different than what you planned on as an option, <laughs> but it was cool, letting that be the answer and mm -hmm. um, going with it. It's so. a good work. Mm -hmm. yeah. she, she she did warn us in the beginning um, that she, she, like when we were doing like a session zero kind of style, she's like, mm -hmm. there will be some roles that you will not be able to succeed without help from somebody. That's just how yeah. they are. Right. You know, so, so be proactive mm -hmm. on helping each other. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that, that's just a really, I think a really great style of, of GMing. Yeah, yeah I agree. agree. Mm -hmm. Any particular assists from your fellow players stand out to you? Like I would not have lived, but for. Um, for me, it's when we actually, it's right after the, this, this ice skating rink, when we slid down yeah. the slide in there. And I don't know, that was the one time for I got, you know, knocked unconscious. So it was very traumatic for me. Yeah. Um, all the, I mean, Silas picked up for, <laughs> So um, yeah, that, that was when I really had to rely on my my teammates, and then you know falling through some. It was it was a lot going on, and I definitely know that whole sequence could not have been survivable without all of us trying to figure out what we can do. We were like, what do we have in our back pockets that we can, you know? And that's what D and D is. So that's what made it really sort of authentic and fun, mm -hmm. even though it's dramatic. Yeah, I, I'm I'm struggling to think of a specific. Uh, mm -hmm example but i think um i mean in a lot of ways it's 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 the whole story i mean it it's there's these characters would not survive this without the the knowledge and experience of these specific other people that are in this group you know we rely on the strengths of everyone else and the the skills of everyone else um because we, we couldn't get through this with a different group, a different mm -hmm. composition, you know. I think I think a great example of when us working together and having checks that we helped each other with was when we were trying to get the, the train started. Yeah. Mm. There was there was a lot of checks and a lot of deciding who do who does what and who helps with what. And that yeah. was a really great play of team teamwork. Yeah, and actually everything leading up to that too, when we were going through the train trying to find the the wrenches and everything. Yeah. That there yeah. were a lot of teaming up on that too. Um yeah. But I, I love the stacked the stacked skill roles where you need you need the help from everyone else. It's yeah. you gotta have those assists. Oh, that's such a good memory. Like it just sort of flashed back. I think that was when, like, right when Fruza was starting to like act a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, the memories. Mm. I will say one thing about this series that I've totally loved. I mean, is that is how creative everyone gets with their fighting just in general. Everyone's like, let me come up with something completely bogus. Like everybody. And then the rolls, the dice support it. So I guess, yes, <laughs> this is what you're doing. So it ends up being this thing. And that's what's been the most fun. It's like I've had some of the best like random fighting uh, successibility weirdnesses that have just gone off okay. And I can picture them in my head, so that makes it really fun for me. <laughs> it's a very cinematic story. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. But also none of y'all's three characters started out as fighters. Uh, courtroom battles notwithstanding. So, what do you think your characters think of the fighters they've become? Because we've talked on previous episodes mm -hmm. of sort of the broad trajectory, but also, I don't know, I see Miss Ruffin just firebolting things now, and that's really quite a long way to come. I, Feruza's just like batter up with an axe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And heaven forfend, uh, Maeve, Maeve should ever have her eye on me. Yeah. Um, for Maeve, at least, it, it's been very much 
a journey of her combat reflecting her internal experience and her her journey as a person um through this story you know it, it's she started out very very removed from combat she would she would <laughs> be at a, a real distance um and and only engage directly when she absolutely had to and over time she's gotten much more willing to take things on you know literally head to head um so i think a lot of that has been kind of an externalization. I mean, so much of Maeve is about sort of that thing that happens when you're in that liminal part of your life and you can't, you can't help but things becoming externally apparent no matter how much you try and hide them. Um, so everything from the patterns in her horns to the way she fights are things she's tried to keep secret that you just, it's the blushing you, that you can't hide. Um, so her fighting has become her kind of coming to terms and becoming more confident in her own ability and skill and willing to willingness to take on things directly rather than from rather than being removed from them. I know that was a bit of a rambling answer, but it, it's one of the things I thought the most about when I was thinking about who I wanted this character to be and what I hoped might be her journey, you know. I'm proud of her. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, proud of her growth. She's growing up. She's growing. Seriously, She's comparing. Growing. She communicates mm -hmm. about feelings sometimes a little bit, maybe a little. Maybe with sharp points, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> you know what they're right. Someone who can get to the point. <laughs> this makes me think of like, so part of Maeve's like shield or wall, I believe is like, is somewhat her sarcasm. But some of the best moments are when Maeve is doing something and we're like, Maeve, Maeve, are you okay? And then she'll say something really messed up. We're like, yeah, she's fine. That's <laughs> <laughs> my favorite moment. <laughs> That was my favorite moment. Um, for Feruza, it was that. So Feruza is a character that is outwardly, you know, she's very in control of her life. She went to Harvard in case you missed that. Um, she works for a law firm. <laughs> she's, a firm. she's done everything right in her life, but there's a lot of, she has to hold a lot of insecurities. I mean, she's this tall, skinny girl. She has, you know, was hit by lightning, her hair turned gray. She's sort of like, well, I guess the nice and easy is, is that gonna work? Um, so this whole story, as she's gotten stronger and begun to trust her own, trust herself, like who she is and just become more confident in herself, that is reflected in her abilities and skills and how strong she is and the things that she'll try without second guessing herself. Because in the beginning, you have this barbarian and I specifically wanted it that way, where she wouldn't rage. And that you, if you don't rage as a barbarian, you lose, <laughs> you lose. <laughs> People were like, I mean, the comments like, why isn't she raging? And I was like, it's because she does not have it yet. So over time, now she knows what she has to do. Like she immediately gets, you know, she gets in that position and she goes reckless and she rages and she knows what she's doing. But that was the journey of the whole thing. And that was the, one of the best things about this particular game is that we played it that way. We didn't play it at all the time optimally. We played it characterly. <laughs> Just to tell a better story, you know what I mean? So, and now we have Feruza at the most Feruza-ist, as opposed to the, oh, can I get my axe and hit it? Ah, <laughs> now she's like this. Ah! <laughs> An extra attack is badass, man. <laughs> <laughs> what about robin like throwing fire at things <laughs> fireball it is one of the most incongruous perhaps <laughs> how do you think she feels about the more combat style because certainly slow and whatnot clutch control ability deployment but also you know you granny drops fireballs at this point oh something she'll always regret but uh it, it comes down to like robin is just you know growing up on the 
at the school playground being the the one who stands up to bullies for the little kids and like yeah. doing what needs to be done and um she's had a lot of life to live to know that you know when when you got to fight you got to fight and maybe she's had a couple experiences in the past that helps her with that decision but uh overall she's a protector and that's how i built her you know she's abjuration wizard she's she, she it, it's gonna be her motivation that if someone's in trouble she does what needs to be done to protect them mm. with a backpack full of paper dolls yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, most I of love the doll are using them yeah 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 it is true yeah. I hope wherever they are, they're doing very well and they're making their mama proud. Yeah, always. <laughs> Make me sad. That was so much fun. And I, I don't think I've gotten to talk about that like on an on the air table for us. Like when Deb gave us that house and, and each of us got to take a treasure or a gift, that was so much fun. <laughs> So I feel like each of us took something that's perfect for our characters, but is like sort of messed up. And that's that makes me happy. I mean, Bruises was a shield that just has a weird expression on it. I think that's kind of ridiculous, but it <laughs> and I, I didn't choose mine. I sort of let Deb choose. Right. And that's that's the right. only things I did was I, I chose the right. name, which the ring has a name. And I chose the, mm. the, the, um, the Q word for it. That's right. That was because I, I had thoughts about those things. So that was that was the customization I got on my item. But otherwise, the, the ring was uh, a gift from our dungeon master. Thoughts, you say, about the word? Yeah, um, I, I was interested. I mean, we're getting we're getting enough of, of in the information that it's no longer. I mean, if, if you know anything about pulsars, they're uh, two different. You get two different. Um, colors flashing um and there's a duality to them um and specifically uh there uh I, this hasn't come up and i don't know if it ever will um but i called it the circlet of sursinus um for one of the pulsars in the god's hand nebula um because mm -hmm. Maeve wears that hand necklace and so immediately i it just felt like the right, there was something about that that immediately I went, oh, that's that's the right place and that's the right star. Um, so, and that idea of like the storm that's captured in the ring. So that, that sort of was where I was going with that. And it seemed to fit with the things that were happening to Maeve. Um, there are things that were starting to be uncovered, which I'm curious where they're all going. <laughs> Yeah. I guess we'll see, but I do have some questions about those items because you all have the ones that you've picked up and your signature items that you came in with, um, you know, albums, backpacks, Harvard apparel. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any items that your characters have gotten in this game that you wish you had in real life does not have to be limited to your own character i know i would really love Maeve's pocket knife it seems very useful i know <laughs> um yay like any item yeah i mean well i just look if people appreciate robin's backpack that's just, that's just recognition because I mean that's just useful yeah I can't believe I tried not to make it a bag of holding but Deb was kind of allowing me to let it be a bag of holding <laughs> as it grew bigger uh, but yeah that's a good one yeah <laughs> anyone's item you'd want to snag Alicia I'm sitting here thinking and because I'm ADHD I'm sitting here thinking about the time when um Robin jumped in the backpack and the backpack <laughs> landed on Bruce's shoulder. That was very funny. Um, so, so you basically just want like a grown up baby Bjorn. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. The game stuff was good. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, I mean, of course, I want an axe that is also a gavel. Who doesn't want that? 
I'm trying to think if there's, if there's anything really like I could want aside. Wait, no, that. what are you using this axe for? We got to back it up. I need elaboration. Alicia, what are you doing with that axe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, you need to see my blades. I'm full of weapons and armor in this place. Over there is like, we like weapons galore. That would be like the most epic of weapon though. You know what I mean? Like I have some good ones over there, but that would just be crazy. Especially if it could morph back and forth like that. Like, yeah, the weapon thing, of course, that's what I want the most. I mean, otherwise it's, I do love that Harvard wardrobe. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, I wanted her to, I wanted her personality to be this big friggin' axe. And so <laughs> That was that was definitely going to be part of it because it's the axe changes as she does. Remember, it was that little tiny axe with the whatever, and then now it's like this massive great axe. It, it changed <laughs> with her. Yeah, I love fairies so much. <laughs> I love the Alicia that's in Feruza. I was thinking to myself, oh well, I wouldn't want to limit it to one's own character. Alicia might not be able to make real life use of an axe. I shouldn't limit her. Oh, no. No, no. We'll take the axe. Thank you. She absolutely oh, yeah. would. My neighbor's kids want in my place. I feel like if the door stays open, they will run in here because they want to see what I have in here. If I had something like that in here, I mean, when I think of the sheer size of what that axe is, when when she rate, when Faruza rages, that axe is, woo, beautiful, just majestic. Yeah. So if you ever oh, well. have an opportunity at Axes R Us, you're going to take it. Good to know. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. <laughs> Keep it moving. <laughs> ask and you shall receive, apparently. Uh, oh, but God. we also had a pretty cool question since we're talking about sort of the trajectory of where your characters and their builds have gone. Uh, Lauren asked, is there a skill or a power or a spell that you never thought your character would take at the beginning? Uh, or uh, something that you ended up taking because of the story that you didn't see in those initial meetings when you sat down with that? That's a good question. That's yeah. a really good Lauren. question. Lauren's pretty good. Lauren's pretty effing great. I see it's good. I think mine is actually the opposite. I think it's more the things that I didn't take. Like, that... I had opportunities to swap things out or change to things that would generally, you know, in a different campaign be considered more optimal um, for this character or for this build or for the, the subclasses I had. Um, and instead, I, the, the things I had chosen felt so much a part of Maeve's personality. Um, Maeve, Maeve is not an optimized build. Um, I, I didn't get a, a lot of things that other characters get much earlier until as far back <laughs> as you can go, basically, um, before you get goodies. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think a lot of it was that in a different campaign, you know, if you're looking at you know may may has some hex blade happening and and usually people go oh yeah you take darkness devil's sight like there there are sort of the the expected things that you take and and that's you know a lot of the things that i took with me i either didn't use very often but they felt like they were part of who she was um like her ability to disguise herself it doesn't come up very often but when it does it feels very much foundational to who she is and mm -hmm. I would rather have that than swap it for something that's useful Absolutely. all the time, but not nearly um, as fun. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's, I don't know. So I think the, the, the not changing things that felt like they were part of her um, was for Maeve more... Um, in some ways more unexpected than new things I scooped up along the way, if that makes any sense. So you thought you were going to be making swaps on the way up and you ended up not Yeah, swapping. yeah. Anything in particular like, we're allowed to know about? 
I mean, I just think, especially with the spells, um, when you get access to the higher level spells, that that's generally a time when you're going to go, oh, cool, there's this fancier thing. I'll take that and drop this other piece. And um, like, I can't imagine, you know, giving up something like don't touch me creep, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, <laughs> a low level ability but it's so much a part of who she is and mm -hmm. so to have to give that up to get something that would be a higher level you know similar or you know um or completely different spell that might have more versatility or might have more you know mechanical power to it mm -hmm. um just felt wrong it felt like it was taking away her identity by changing that out so yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think like, I mean, with D&D &D as a game, there are so many different ways you can play it. Like you can play it where it's super about role play, play it where it's super about combat. Um, this, you know, this, this particular campaign is, well, there's a lot of combat, but I mean, there's a, it definitely, there's a lot of importance put on who these, building these characters and the, the story behind all the, all the combat stuff, because it's for a stream. So, um, Regarding barbarians, it is very like controversial to <laughs> make a caster version barbarian at all because it weakens them. Generally, they can't rage, they can't cast spells when they're they can't they're rage against. So it's a bunch of reasons why you should should not you know I guess sully a barbarian by spells. But there were a couple things that just made sense for this character. And this is what um, Jen was saying regarding Maeve, the same thing. I could have made for just this massive, you know, swinging barbarian, but there were some things that would just be great, like story points. And so instead of doing the, um, uh, you know, the upping your skill numbers, I chose to do feats, which gave me some magical abilities, even if they're, even though they're, they're very weak. Um, they allowed me to create a story about, around something she's trying to do. So that's why they're like, for instance, just to bring up one that I added, it was lightning lore because it's like that lasso. And I told you this way back in our very first on the air today that Fruze is like my ode to my favorite superhero. So it's like She-Hulk, this big tall woman with a lawyer. <laughs> then there's Storm, she's a weather witch. So the lasso is who? Wonder Woman. There you go. <laughs> so... So also, and, this, and it's, it also, it was kind of fun because I could make it sort of lightning related, which is part of one of her sort of, uh, I guess, specs. So that's, yeah, that, it just goes along with the story. But I did not think I was going to make her a, a caster of any type. But when Deb said, what do you think? Go with it. That's what I decided to do it. <laughs> when did you know that you were going to take those magical feats then, if not at the beginning? Definitely was there any particular beginning. point in the story where it seemed right? Yeah, it was the, where were we in the story? We went up that like frosty avalanche and there was a big bird. And I remember it was right before all that. And I was like, there are just things I feel like she should be able, we're in a magical place. And yes, she can get big and strong and she can knock your, your clock off with, it, with an ax. But what if there's something else that's a little bit like, Whoa, I didn't, and then it, it's fun because with powers like that, when they first use them, like the, whoa, what did I just do? That's what I really wanted to experience. And if you only have a barbarian that just hits and smashes, I'm never really going to have that experience, you know? So that was, a, that was my way of making her interesting, more interesting. <laughs> I think for Robin, I uh, did not ever plan to or expect to take fireball <laughs> but i've never played a wizard before and when the opportunity came up in my spell book to get fireball i couldn't help myself that's all <laughs> no when you can have it. that handful of dice yeah. <laughs> i'll probably never use it again but it's oh the God. it's the point of just like it doesn't make sense for her character. It doesn't, you know, but I just had to try it. You know, you just have to. So that that's just that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at me. You gotta try things and see whether or not you like and 
who tries a bunch of things if not Miss Robin, right? <laughs> you know what? That's very fair. Maybe that's in character. <laughs> Just trying it out, but we don't expect it to recur. Was it really so negative an experience for the caster to throw a fireball? When, when you're still throwing fire bolts yeah. with fair abandon. <laughs> <laughs> All I know is it worked. You know, it was not a great result, but we did what it needed to do, plus some. <laughs> uh, and I think everyone forgave me, so I think we're good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Were things on fire that weren't on fire before? If yes, then Fireball was successful at being a fireball. Yeah. What more could you ask? At least we were outside, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to think about any spells that, like, anybody did that affected the rest of everyone. I think that Faruza had one where she did Thunder Wave. And it was because she didn't realize she, the reason why she did that is because she did not know she could thunder wave. So the fact that her friends were standing there, <laughs> they had to roll, but they all did well. So it worked out, but it, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a tagline. It could have been worse. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I knew it was going to be like semi controversial. Like, if you don't know you have the ability to do something, you're going to do it and then go, whoa, shoot. Wow. Didn't realize that was a thing. <laughs> So, yeah. I want to see Alicia play a wild magic sorcerer now. <gasps> oh, like that just that like if if this is giving you so much joy, like that that is going to give you so much joy. <laughs> and you know, I rarely play casters. I usually always play melee because I'm a I'm a tank by nature. But I think I would do a wild magic sorcerer just so I could it's is it troll like or no? It's troll like because the dice troll, right? Well, exactly. yeah, you have, you have a you have a chart and you roll a d hundred yeah. and it has a result that is a result <laughs> and it can that do a multitude of things. It, it's fun, but, but we don't we can talk about it another time. But yeah. it would be, it's exactly the kinds of things you're looking for. It's it's uncontrollable magic that you go, oh, that happened. Well, I'm sure your team loves that. <laughs> If it's you enjoy though. exploding your friends, you might like Wild Magic Sorcerer. <laughs> exploding your friends, possibly summoning a unicorn. You never know. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. They're really fun. The things. That might be, it might, might be an interesting thing to try at some point. Hmm. Hmm. How? So you're a tank by nature. Yes. Uh Hope is not a, a wizard, uh, like <laughs> deep wizard main. Nope. Um, and you never played a wizard before. Nope. <gasps> <laughs> it's like the classic where you're it like, is. nope. <laughs> is I'm it just druid. all the all the spells, or is this too much? Is no, I'm a druid by heart. I've always played yeah. druids. I love them. I don't know. How much have you done builds like Maves? Um, I've played similar builds a little bit. Um, my favorite things to play are I I love Gish builds just in general. So I do love um blade singers. I mean, I love I love casters. I, I'm I'm a caster nerd. Um, but uh, blade singers are probably my favorite of all time because you get all of the fun of, of sword play and also all of the fun of wizard and then throw elves in. And that sort of is, that's my, that's where I live. Um, my heart is, I mean, I named a character for one of, for Blade Singer lore in the original second edition books. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I love that stuff, but um, I, I'll, I'll play anything. I mean, I, I, I'll play anything just, but no, in terms of in terms of Maeve, um, I love rogues. I've I I think I tend to do rogues that have a little flicker of magic at least in there because mm -hmm. I like the creativity that magic allows you to have. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be arcane trickster. It can be 
coming from anywhere. So I, I don't know. Um, but Maeve's personality was something that was pretty new for me. There was a lot about her that was um, personality wise different for me to play. Oh. What personality do you usually like? What person, what's your usual? Look at me taking over the interview. <laughs> Um, Sorry. I tend to play really high, I, t I play a lot of high end characters because, uh, I mean, for casters, a lot of the time, that's what you need. Um, or, you know, I, it's rare that I've played a character who is, you know, very high charisma, but chooses not to use it. You know, characters who have really high stats, but are actively choosing to make the wrong choice. Like Maeve is, is, could be running the show and is not comfortable with that at all she knows it and she's way too afraid to do it so she's going to make the bad choice intentionally so that she doesn't have to be responsible oh. um so there's sort of is like this this layers upon layers with her um and having high stats but actively choosing not to use them i just realized like, i've never done before like that I think I realized something. Like, I think all of us, you, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I know a few of uh, Hope's characters too, but I, I, I usually play characters that are very, very assured. Like they know what they're doing. Did we all play characters that are sort of like, I don't want to say flawed. Flawed's not the word. It's more like um, underconfident, yet they're tasked with saving worlds. You know what I mean? So they all had a ride to the occasion and we have like Silas is a land thief. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, to, like they, all, yeah, they sort of had to come together like this random crew of people who are, you would not imagine could save themselves. <laughs> well, I think we, we talked about in the beginning that we knew this was going to be a fairy tale. And um, part of that, you know, when you look at fairy tale, now I'm going to go into folklore nerd mode do it, um, do it. but i, way, yeah, do I studied it. this stuff um uh but um part of what that model is about is you go into the woods one way and come out a different way um and you learn <laughs> your lessons and grow up in the process so i think we all chose characters that had a long way to go so that we could go into the story one way and have a lot of growth and come back out a different way. So, I mean, for Maeve, I intentionally chose a character. I built a character who was of an age where she was going to be not sure where she was going in life and not ready to go there with a career that didn't have a clear trajectory. You know, everything about her was liminal going in. So she was entering in this incredibly liminal space. So she could be pushed whichever way she needed to go to grow and change so that by the end of this story she can come out you know kind of fully cooked um in in <laughs> what whether that means going full terrifying i am you know the evil overlord of whatever because that's the path i got put on or whether that means coming out and being like i am a champion of the people and you know what, <laughs> you know wherever that leads us but um the liminality i think is is was key for all of us i think we all had something about our lives that we built into our characters to have that opportunity for that growth and change mm, it's so symbolic so much of it is symbolic like i think about when we lost the train like for good i was like we lost the train that was that was that was a moment for us when we had to, you know, go forward without that sort of security blanket. Train is gone. <laughs> it's gone. Off the rails. Yep, gone. Boom. And that was like, like one of those moments where I was like, okay, certain things. When we, when we, when we lost Steve, you know, all moments, moments. Mm -hmm. Always mm -hmm. in our hearts. Yeah. And our pockets, if you're Maeve. <laughs> you, that. Oh, God. you just got some pockets, Steve. I do. Oh, I have God. I have a Steve Stone. It's oh, it's literally in my inventory as a Steve Stone. Oh. I think it's funny that we just named him Steve. Like, is his name even Steve? We don't know, but he looks like a Steve to me. Well, no, it was because it was Steve's mine. And oh, yeah, we decided he that it. he was Steve. We decided he yeah. must have been Steve. And he broke Robin's arm. 
<laughs> it was on its arm. Crushed it with love, yes. I think. <laughs> it was so. I can't believe how long ago that was, though. Like I think about them, like that was really a long time ago. It really was. Yeah, that was the first time that I think it was the first time Bruce and Robin went somewhere together. Yeah, it was so and great. It was the rat because it was the rat cave, you know. Yeah, and they had to solve that puzzle. It was great. It was so much fun. We had a lot of fun. Shout out, of course, to Nicholas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas wow. and Christine. There's a lot behind all of our characters, but there's even more coming up. Without getting into too much, anything you think we should keep our eye on about each of y'all's characters with what comes next? I... <sighs> Yeah, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. You started first. You go. I started talking before I was done thinking. All right, here we go. <laughs> um, I think for Robin, it's just uh, keep an eye out for maybe her realizing there's a lot that she hasn't done still. Probably. She, you know, there's a... I'm, I won't say I'm running out of jobs that I have, you know, but um, definitely <laughs> running out of being able to tie them to the experiences that we're having, you know, mm -hmm. at the beginning, it was easy to be like, oh, I can do this because I did this. But now it's kind of like, what are we <laughs> doing? <laughs> so what is that? <laughs> there's a little growth there that's probably coming. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it's what to look look out for without giving like too much away. For Farisa, it's just her the reason before the end of all of this, whenever it is, you know, um, you'll find out the whole like her the the why of of Farisa. It 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 all comes to the one reason. Why fruit? Why everything that has happened to Frieza from the very beginning of her life, um, all the stories we've been through. If you've been watching since the very first one, you remember when Frieza was struck by light. When she told the story about how she was struck by lightning and um, uh, the things she's seen in throughout this series, um, it, it all, everything will get answered, and it all makes sense. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for Maeve, I think she's gained a lot of confidence and now it's about finding vulnerability mm. um, because she's, she's gotten now into like the literal, like coming into her namesake of, of Flynn and swinging from place to place and getting the swashbuckler arrow flame <laughs> happening um but now she can have that sort of swagger it's finding the vulnerability so that she can come to the balance of the two and that means confronting a lot of fears that she has not been ready to tackle mm. So yeah, I think that's where, what, what to look out for Maeve coming up. Um, and also answering the, the, the big questions that are currently hovering about uh, voices and rings and, uh, <laughs> you know, how our group is going to take things on moving forward. Yeah. It's true. It all does seem to be building up to something. And as much as I try to prize spoilers from all of you, if anyone knows what the future holds for a game, it's the Dungeon Master. It's dead. <laughs> She's mysteriously missing in action. <laughs> she knows what's going to happen. <laughs> well, then I think we should hear from her ourselves because we do have for all of you, a video 
from Deb herself <gasps> to give us some insight into what's coming up for Children of Erte. Oh. Hi everyone, Deborah here. Um, I just wanted to come on and uh, say we have a little bit of an announcement uh, for Children of Erte here. I want to start by saying thank you so much to everyone who's been involved with the show, Sam, Adam, Josh, the entire cast. Um, it's just been such an incredible journey and um, we are starting to come up on the end of that story. So I want to thank all of you who have come with us along this, this adventure and experienced it from day one, or if you've jumped in in the middle, we're so grateful to have you. And it's a little bittersweet, you know, we're, um, we're sad to be coming to the end of it, but also I'm so thrilled uh, that we can see the conclusion of these incredible characters that our cast has created and you know where they will end up and how this world will sort of resolve itself so again just an enormous thank you and an expression of my gratitude to all of you who have watched you know from the beginning or come in and joined us along the way um you are an integral part to this experience and thank you for making it so special Nothing quite like hearing it from the source. Mm. These adventures have come such a long way. And as Deb's alluded to, there's a climactic final showdown coming their way. These fine people have recorded the series finale of Children of Erte, and it will air on Tuesday, March 26th. But until then, Tune in next week at 6 p.m. Pacific for the next episode of Children of Erte as our heroes prepare for what's to come. It wasn't the train ride we expected, but the Starlight Special has certainly given us something <laughs> special indeed, as have my guests here tonight. So thank you, all of you, so much for joining me. But for thank tonight, you. we're going off the air today. Bye, everyone.